Welcome to this video on group analysis. My name is Mark Jenkinson and I'm going to be taking you through some examples now of different kinds of group analysis that we can do. It's generally going to be framed around task F and right, but much of this is very relevant for other types of group analysis. So let's consider different cases. The first case that I'll consider is a single group average. Here we've got eight different subjects. They're all in the one group and I want to ask about the mean of that group. That is, does the group activate on average? If I consider what's ha happening across that group, can I be reliably sure that I, I have an activation at this particular location? So, you know, I am implicitly assuming that I'm at a particular anatomical location and that all of these values have been pulled out from that particular location. We're actually going to do the same thing in every different location. So we do a voxel-wise analysis. But here we just consider one voxel. So here I'm showing you the effect size, the beta value, for our eight different subjects just stacked up vertically. So each line, each horizontal line is for one subject and the vertical ordering, it doesn't matter. I'm going to estimate the mean for this particular group and then I also want to estimate the variance because I want to do mixed effects typically. So I want the between subject variance to be estimated as well. And our significance test is really going to be about can I be sure that the mean of this group is positive, is it's greater than zero, which is the same as saying, you know, how much of that tail is less than zero? Because there will always always be some of it. And that gets back to our standard sort of null hypothesis situation of is there you know more than five percent chance that it's less than zero or not? And that's how we're going to sort of determine the, the significance. What I'm going to talk about now is really how to set these kind of models up within the software, how to set up the GLM in order to answer these questions, not the theory behind how the stats works. So here's how we would set up a group design within FEET or within our, our GLM tools in general. So what you see here is that actually we've specified that for a single group, we just need one EV. We want to know about the average across that group, and an average is just calculated by putting ones down the column. So for every element which has got a one, we're taking that in as part of the set of things that we're taking the average of. So here we've got eight different ones. We want the average of all eight. So our column is really easy. It's just a set of ones. The other thing that you see here is the number of groups, and that's the number of different variances, which I'm going to associate with that. So in a previous talk, we saw that different, we can split different variances across different groups. In this case, we've only got one group, so we're only going to have one variance group. And the number that we put in this group column is just the label. So every, every individual here is in group one because we only have one group. Another thing to point out here is that actually we've got inputs which are just labeled input one, input two, input three, down to input eight. Now, in this case, we've got a single group. We've got one input per subject. And the order that you put those in is totally up to you. It's an arbitrary choice. So you're going to have to decide, you know, whether Mark is input one or whether you know, Keith is input one. This is something that is up to you to order. And you should do it systematically and remember what it is because it's going to be very important. In this instance, it's actually not important because it's a single group and it's really boring. But once we get into the more complicated designs, it's absolutely crucial that you remember what that ordering is and have it systematically done. We have recommended orderings for certain of the designs that we have. And those designs are only valid for the ordering which we have used. If you change that ordering, you need to change your designs appropriately. And that simply means basically taking the row which is associated with that and shifting it. So all of the values for that EV would shift according to where that input ends up in your particular ordering. Normally, it's just easier to stick with the, the ordering which has been suggested. And then we also need to specify contrast. So just in the same way that we did in the first level GLMs, we set up our EVs and then we also need to have contrasts. So here, our contrast, because we've only got one EV, is pretty easy. We just have a, a single contrast value, which is one. And that's going to ask the question of when is the group mean greater than zero? If we wanted to ask the question, when was the group mean less than zero? 
then we'd actually have a contrast which was minus one instead of plus one. So we could have two different contrasts of interest here. In this example, I'm only going to include the positive case. But remember that all of these tests are signed, so we can ask either the positive or the negative case. Here we're going to look at when is the group mean greater than zero. And this is what it would look like in the little graphical view that you have. So what you see here is on the, the left, we have the numbers associated with our group column. So that's just our encoding of the variance group. So they're all in group one. Here we have our standard coding of the EV. So all the values happen to be one. So we've got a red bar, which is to the right hand side and the color coding in which represents the same information is just all white. So all at the maximum value, all at one. And here we have our one and only contrast. We've called it group mean and it's just a single value of one. And that's all we need to do. If we've got a single group, we want to ask about the average of that group and whether that average activation is greater than zero or not. That's it. Very easy to set up. So that's how we would do a single group. Now let's consider the next case. Two different groups, but unpaired. So we've got different subjects in each group. So say we've got a patient group and a control group. Here we've got different numbers of subjects in, in the group as well. We've got nine patients and seven controls. Again, we're showing them in this little diagram at, uh, at the bottom. We've colored them differently just so that you can see the different groups. And again, stack them up in that way. The order is just um, due to the two groups, as you can see. Then what we're interested in, is there a significant difference between these groups? And that really is going to boil down to, is the mean of the two different groups different from each other? So if we calculate the mean of each group, have we got a significant difference between those two mean values? So we need to estimate the means of the two different groups. And so we have two different mean values that we need to estimate. And then we also want to look at the between subject variability within each of the groups. And so we're going to have that as well. And then we're really going to test for is that separation between those group means significant with respect to how much spread that we can see. So when there's a lot of overlap of those distributions, then again, it will be likely that we'll be over our 5% threshold and it would be not significant. In terms of setting it up within the software, this is what the, the panel would look like in feet or within our GLM tool. What you have is now we've got two different EVs because we need one for each group mean. Because we've ordered the subjects in this particular way, we're actually got, we've got the first nine subjects are going to be the ones from the patient group and that actually re represents the first nine going up here. And then the other seven are going to be from the controls. EV1 we're going to put ones for the first nine and then zeros for the rest. And that simply means that we're taking an average of those first nine values. That's the average of that patient group. EV2, we're going to have zeros, except for the last seven where we've got ones. And so that's taking an average of those where we have ones, an average of the control group. And so that's simply what these two EVs represent. They represent the means of the two different groups. In addition to that, we then have the variances that we want to estimate within each group. And one of the options that we've got is to have a different estimate in the two different groups, which is what I've shown here. We've got, and now we've specified that there are two groups and we've labeled the groups such that the first nine are in group one and the other seven are in group two. So these are just numerical labels to represent the groups. The actual numbers are not interesting, but it is important that they have different labels from each other. And that is what we would do if we did want to have and different estimates for the two different groups. But as I said, you should have a, a good reason before doing that. And you also should have a decent number of subjects in each group. We don't have 20 subjects in, in this case, so we would not do it. This is actually quite a low number of subjects. We not normally do an experiment like this anyway, but in any instance, if you decide that you don't want to have two different groups, then you would simply say you had one group and that you had uh, simply ones all down this group column. And what you can see in terms of the diagram on the right is that now we have the same estimate because we're actually pooling our estimates. We're going to estimate the same variance for both of the groups. So it's going to be an average of what we had from the case before. 
And generally that will do a lot better when the numbers are smaller. And then when the numbers get bigger and there's a good reason to expect that there are two different variances in the groups, then it can be useful to split it into the two different groups. And so that's what the design matrix looks like. Then the contrasts that we set up are fairly easy too. So remember that EV1 was the group mean for one of our groups, the patient group. EV2 was the group mean for the other group, the controls. And then our contrasts would typically look like 1 minus 1, which would be the difference between the means of the patients minus the means of the controls. Or we could do minus 1, 1. And the questions that they are going to ask are simply, when is the mean activation that we'd have from the patient group greater than the mean activation from the control group? That would be contrast one here, the plus one, minus one. When is EV1 or the, the parameter associated with that beta one greater than beta two? And so because of the way we've encoded it, that would be patients greater than controls. And then if we wanted to know about controls greater than patients, we ask the opposite one, minus one, plus one. In terms of what it looks like, here we can see the coding of the different variance group down here, ones and then twos. The two different EVs encoded graphically. So the red line is along the right when it's one and then it's center when it's zero. The color coding is white when it's one and, and mid gray when it's zero. And then the opposite one for EV two. And the two contrasts then are at the bottom as you can see here. Generally, it's good to give the contrast better names than this. A minus B is not particularly helpful. So it would be better to say patients greater than controls, for instance. And then that tells you what kind of question you're actually asking. Another example is the paired t-test, where we've got two fMRI sessions per person. And we're interested in the difference between those two sessions. That might be that there's a baseline and a follow-up scan, which is looking at how things change over time, and that might pre be pre and post intervention or pre and post drug, or it might be that you've got two different types of conditions and you simply have split it up into two different sessions. In this situation, we now can see that we've got two different measurements per individual. So each line now, we've got a red cross and a blue circle. And we're interested in, is there a significant difference between the conditions? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at that difference. And the most naive way that we could do it is in a non-paired way, an unpaired way that we've just done before. And if we do that, we measure a mean for the red and a mean for the blue. And actually, by comparison with the spread around those, there that difference would not be significant in this case at all. But if you actually have a look at the distribution of this data, and you look at how often the blue circle is to the right of the red cross, it is almost always to the right, which means that it is almost always greater than that. But that doesn't really get borne out when we use it as in an unpaired way. And that's because a paired t-test is more sensitive because it actually takes into account that it's the difference that really matters, not where they are with respect to other subjects, and so not where the center of those two is with respect to other subjects. More specifically, it's the subject means, the center between these two points, that varies a lot. And a lot of our variance that we were capturing before about the, the means of each group was just driven by this. But we don't care about that in this instance. What we care about is what is the difference between these two and how does that difference vary across the different subjects. So we want to capture the between subject variance of the difference. And we actually the mean value here where they're centered is a complete confound that we don't care about. So we actually want to just get rid of that. And we can get rid of that by simply shifting them all so that all of their means are at the same point. And that's what this would look like. And if you look at that representation of the data, it's very easy to see that actually all the blues are to the right except one. Um, and so there is a clear predominance of a positive effect if we're looking at blue minus red. And so now we can see that there is very likely to be a statistically significant difference between these two conditions. And this is how we're going to do our analysis. We're going to set it up in that way so that actually now if we did it like this and we took the mean of the red and the mean of the blue and we looked at the spread about those, those spreads are much smaller and we have a much greater 
a chance of seeing statistical significance in this instance. And that's why we do the paired t-test. Now setting it up in our GUI is a little bit more complicated than we've seen before because we have to do this shifting. And the shifting is done on a per subject basis. And so it's a lot bigger, but actually the concept is just what you've seen here. So this is what it looks like. And as I said, it looks quite big and can be difficult to sort of look at initially and understand what it's doing. So we'll, take, we'll go step by step. So to start with, the number of EVs that we actually use is nine. That's one for each subject. And we've got eight subjects here. So we've got one EV per subject, which is going to model the mean and it's going to effectively subtract that so that all the means are aligned. And then there's going to be an extra one, which is going to look at our average difference. So let's take the last EV, for example. That's the one which is modeling the mean of subject number eight. Now, it's important to understand how we've ordered our inputs. And that's always important whenever you do these group level GLMs to know which order you've got the inputs. And it's good to have a systematic way of doing it. In a paired t-test case, one of the best ways to do it is simply to have all of the inputs from one of the conditions grouped together by with the subject number increasing. So input one would be condition one, so the, the, the red cross, for instance, for subject one. Input two would be the red cross for subject two. Input three would be subject three for condition one, etc. all the way down to input eight. And then inputs nine to 16 would again be subjects one through to eight in that order, but for the other condition. So in this case, the blue circle. And then if you look carefully at this EV at the end, you'll see that it's all zeros except for two entries, input eight and input 16. And that's subject eight in both cases, just the two different conditions. And so, you know, we might call them A and B or, you know, red cross and blue circle, whatever they are. We've got these two different conditions and that EV has only got a one on those two. And so it's gonna take the average of those two. As we've seen before, whenever we've just got ones associated with things, it's going to take the average of whatever is um, associated with the ones. So that's the mean of these two points. And that has the effect of modeling that out so that that mean is then subtracted away. And that's generally what happens with confounds whenever we use the GLM. And so actually EVs two through to EV nine, just do that for all of the subjects. So if you look at them, you can see that in each case, there are just two ones and the rest of the values are zero. And they always occur for the two different um, conditions of a particular subject. EV2 would be subject one, EV3 would be subject two, etc. And that has this effect. We put them in, but we don't care about them. So there are, the GLM is effectively going to model those away. And they've already been taken care of by having been put in the GLM in this fashion. And then our extra EV, EV1, is a column where it's all plus ones for the first date and then minus ones for the second date. And that means it's plus ones for one of the condition and minus ones for the other condition, averaging across both. So it's the average of one condition minus the average of the other condition, which is simply the difference between these two means that we care about. So it's the difference between the dotted red line and the dotted blue line. And that's what EV1 is measuring. But it's measuring after everything has been shifted to be centered around zero because of all of the other EVs that we've got. And that's the whole design matrix. That's all the EVs that we need in order to be able to do a paired t-test. So we put them together. EV1 is the one that we really care about. It's the one that models this difference between the means and EVs two through to EV nine are confounds which are modeling out or removing the individual subject mean for all of these different subjects that we've got. So if we've got more than eight subjects, we're gonna have more EVs. We're gonna have one per subject. And so these design matrices can get quite large when we've got lots of different subjects. If we have this then, we need to set up some contrasts and again, they're fairly simple now because all that we care about is EV1. We don't care about the rest. So the contrast values for EV2 through to EV9 are all zero. The only entry that is non-zero in these contrast vectors is the one associated with EV1. And that's going to be plus one for seeing the case where it's A minus B or minus one for B minus A. And now 
what is A and what is B depends on how we've ordered our inputs and the sign that we've put in EV1. So because inputs 1 to 8 have a plus sign, they're plus 1, and then e, uh, inputs 9 through to 16 are minus 1, having a plus 1 in the contrast means that we are doing the mean of inputs 1 through to 8 minus the mean of inputs 9 through to 16. So that means A is associated with that first set of 8 things. So whatever order we've happened to do it. So I was talking about blue circles and red crosses before. You can decide arbitrarily which ones you want to associate, but you have to keep track of it. And that's the way to do it, is to figure out, okay, for the plus one contrast, C1 here, it means that EV1 is just as normal. So all the ones associated with the plus one would be group A or condition A. And then inverting that, we simply put a minus one in EV in the slot for EV1 in contrast vector 2, zeros everywhere else, and that does the opposite. That does B minus A. But in order to keep track in your head of what is A and what is B, it's good to, to be always clear on what order you've put things in. And then on the right-hand side there, you can see the graphical depiction of this, and that's actually a lot easier to look at than the set of numbers that you can see on the, the far left. You can see that for EVs 2 through to 9, there are just two non-zero values there, and they step down so that in each case we've got the corresponding subject from condition A and condition B. And then EV1 is simply a set of plus ones and a set of minus ones. So it's very easy to see what that design matrix is like and understand it from that point of view. We've also got the group column on the far left, all ones, because we're all just going to have a single group in this case, and we're going to associate a single variance with it. So this is a case of how we would set up the paired t-test. You can see the contrast at the bottom. Again, as I said, it's only EV1 that gets a non-zero value in those contrasts. And that's what we need to do in order to set up a paired t-test. And if this is the kind of data that you've got, this is also called repeated measures, if, because we've got a repeat of uh, value for each subject. This is by far and away the best way of getting uh, a statistically significant result from your analysis.